Published in 2013, after a wildly successful Kickstarter, Monty Cook introduced us to Numenera, an over 400-page volume that offered players and GMs the opportunity to travel a billion years into the future and play out stories that blended themes of science fiction and fantasy into a vibrant, unexpected, and transfixing experience. This original Orange book was expanded and supported through a series of exciting supplements, and four years later, Monty Cook Games announced a bold new step for the game. Referred to as Numenera 2, referencing both a rules revision and the fact that Numenera would now be a complete game offered in two volumes, Discovery and Destiny would replace the original volume as the core Numenera experience. In this video, I'm going to give you a brief overview on what the differences are between the original Legacy Orange Numenera Core rulebook and the more recent Discovery and Destiny volumes. This is not a comprehensive review of the original book or of Discovery and Destiny, but if you aren't sure which volume you should get, or if you're curious about whether the Legacy book is worth looking into, this video will help demystify a common question when getting into Numenera. Later on, I'll also discuss what Destiny has to offer outside of the original Core experience and whether or not it's right for you if you're a fan of the Legacy game or if you're brand new. Destiny is a fascinating book and, I'd argue, completes the promise of a game focused on exploring an endlessly wild and wondrous future. To make things clear, Numenera Discovery and Destiny are the core rulebooks of the game since their release. The original Orange Legacy book is really no longer needed outside of appeal for collectors. If you're brand new to Numenera, you can and should just go straight to Discovery and Destiny. Though MCG referred to Discovery and Destiny as Numenera 2, using terms like 1st and 2nd edition don't really apply. The original volume had a different approach to a handful of concepts like armor and ciphers. Discovery and Destiny Destiny not only introduced some more streamlined approaches to these rules, but they also reframe, for example, the Jack character type in a much more unique way, while also introducing three new character types, along with sets of brand new rules and concepts in the second volume, Destiny. More on that later. While it is often the case that the older editions of an RPG are sometimes nice to revisit, for example, as wonderful as Pathfinder 2nd Edition is, 1st Edition remains a unique enough experience that revisiting it, or for some groups, sticking with it, is to be expected. The evolution of Numenera, however, doesn't really follow this example. The material in the 2013 book and the first book of Numenera's two-volume set, Discovery, are virtually identical, with only a handful of changes that have been made more broadly to the cipher system. As opposed to inventing a new system, Numenera Discovery represents an attempt to reinforce the cipher system, and it largely succeeds in making the language easier to understand, while also removing a few things that were either needlessly tedious, redundant, or perhaps pointed in a different game design direction than what the Cypher system set out to do. If you want nothing more than a replacement of Numenera's 2013 release with no added rules or new character types, Discovery is more akin to a reprinting, with some updated art, clearer language for certain rules, and a couple of tweaks to the system overall. Discovery can be used separate from its companion volume, delivering an experience that is virtually identical to the original Legacy game. The original book does contain a couple of things that are not in Discovery, however, the most important being some setting information, a handful of creatures, and the original four adventures that appeared in Part 8 of the 2013 publication. Discovery itself contains four new adventures, but fortunately the extra setting info, creatures, and adventures are not artifacts lost to time. MCG has made this material accessible via a free 40-page PDF found on the store page for the current Discovery and Destiny books. As I said earlier, the technical differences in Numenera Discovery when compared to the original 2013 book hardly warrant use of the word edition. It's functionally the same game with the same set of rules for characters, task difficulty, XP rewards and expenditure, and of course, an emphasis on discovery, as the title suggests. There are around half a dozen or so concrete changes, however, and here I'll briefly discuss them and why I think they make for a better game. In the original game, wearing armor placed a burden on two of the game's three ability stat pools. Wearing armor meant that a character had a might cost per hour of wearing said armor and a reduction to their maximum speed pool. 
Numenera Discovery simplifies this. There is no might cost per hour for wearing armor, and instead of a reduction to one's speed pool, there is now an extra cost when applying effort to speed-related tasks, with light armor costing one additional point per level of effort, and heavier forms of armor costing more. As is the case with the original game, Glaives and Jax are given the ability to mitigate this extra speed cost. It would appear that the original application of the armor rules in 2013 were more focused on simulating the act of wearing armor, costing might points due to its weight, and limiting your movement capacity by reducing the speed pool. I could see an argument for a more tactical, perhaps more challenging version of Numenera that keeps these rules. However, as someone who played quite a bit of Numenera with the original Legacy material, I almost always ignored the old armor rules as they just became more tedious. Keeping track of how many hours a character has worn their armor in order to deduct the appropriate amount of might points taxed exploration and story development with more bookkeeping. The speed pool reduction also meant that players would have to keep track of two different speed pool totals, how much they had while wearing armor and how much they had while not. By simply adding an extra cost to applying effort to speed-related tasks, Discovery keeps the simulation of restricted and tax mobility for wearing armor without asking the player to keep track of time or make modifications to their pool totals. Also, the fact that pool points take on the role of what other games would use hit points for, the old rules actually made characters more likely to die for wearing armor as their might would be regularly drained and their speed was reduced, a trade-off that made the choice to wear heavier forms of armor a little strange if not cumbersome in my experience. For those who find a bit of an appeal in this older rule set for armor, however, I'd suggest instead of using the legacy rule, you can think of exotic, ninth world sets of armor and defenses that might be ciphers or artifacts even. These might grant greater defensive capabilities in exchange for point costs similar to the old armor rules. My own perspective on Numenera and the Cypher system is that these are games which paint in very broad strokes, leaving the finer, more intricate details up to the players and GM to determine. The skill system is a perfect example of this. With no distinct categories of skills containing precise definitions outside of the Numenera-related skills, a group is free to decide if, as it's even suggested in the book, training in a skill like sailing would encompass all activities related to sailing, or if there should be separate skills like navigation, seafaring, and so on. It's up to each individual group how detailed and nuanced they'd like their game experience to be. Character types are very similar. Glaives tend to cover the broader category of martial fighters and characters of great physical strength and performance, while nanos cover the broader category of magic users and experts in esoteric knowledge. Descriptors and foci allow for the customization and bending of these categories, as does non-mechanical flavor and backstory. In some ways, though, the Jack as it appeared in the original book was perhaps too undefined, mostly sitting somewhere in between Glaives and Nanos, blending together their abilities more often than having unique ability sets of their own. This was built, it would seem, on the promise that the Jack would become a character type that wasn't merely a warrior or magic user, but rather someone who either blends the two together in a way that rogues kind of do in D&D or Pathfinder, or how some players may choose to multiclass in different games. The original Jack was somewhat hollow. Described as a Jack of all trades, they easily felt like masters of none or simply something that just sat in between the other two character types, maybe offering an option for players who just couldn't choose between those two. The Jack as it exists now in Discovery, however, is a substantial improvement. While Jacks can still exist as Glaive Nano hybrids in some ways, they are also given more unique sets of abilities such as Face Morph, allowing them to hide their identity or disguise themselves as someone else. Their Tricks of the Trade open up new social options that elevate roleplay to a new level while giving them combat options that make them a distinctly different opponent from a Glaive or Nano. In my own experience running games with Jax from Discovery, the difference is night and day. Jax routinely become characters that approach challenges and story developments in ways that are firmly distinct from what's available to Glaives and Nanos. The new type abilities lead to more interesting outcomes and developments and inspire more creative takes on what they can currently do. They manage to maintain most of their versatility from the original while keeping enough new options to create a distinctly different kind of character.
The original Numenera core rulebook introduced the world to ciphers, the concept of one-time use abilities activated through various objects found throughout the Ninth World. In 2013, the Orange core book introduced two types of ciphers, Anoetic and Occultic. The differences came about mostly in terms of flavor, but there were some mechanics. As anoetic ciphers were to be simple objects, pills, vials of liquid, or simple one-button machines, occultic ciphers were to be more exotic, complicated, rare, and counted as two ciphers toward a character's limit instead of one. Similar to the original armor rules, this was another designation that was often difficult to put into practice, and it would be ignored more often than not at the tables I ran. In Discovery, ciphers are a single category. They are still incredibly varied in terms of their forms, functions, and power levels, but this streamlining of ciphers more than improves the flow of the game. That said, for those who want more nuanced the ciphers in Numenera, the revised Cipher System rulebook contains different concepts for ciphers with subtle ciphers representing raw abilities or narrative concepts like luck and manifest ciphers representing physical objects. In general, the Cipher System rulebook combined with Numenera opens up the possibility for incredible customization. Those who want to revive the Anoetic and Occultic Cipher designation might benefit from taking a look at how the CSR handles subtle, manifest, and fantastic ciphers. From the beginning of Numenera, XP was always intended to function differently from other RPGs. One of the possible options afforded to players in the 2013 release was to spend 3 XP in order to gain familiarity in certain task-related fields or concepts. As one of the long-term benefit options of spending XP, this mechanic provided a plus one to any die roll related to the chosen task. While it is the case that this word appears in Numenera Discovery, possibly by mistake, this mechanic no longer exists in such a formal way. Any player who spent time exploring the Ninth World has undoubtedly fallen shy of a target number by one, and the promise of a single plus one does feel as if it could add a bit more depth to character builds. The problem, however, is that for just one XP more with the older rule, one could take training in a skill that grants the equivalent of a plus three to the die roll instead of a plus one. Familiarity was a way to spend nearly as much in training a new skill, but wouldn't provide anywhere near the benefit of actually training in a skill. By removing this, XP purchases outside of character advancement are more focused on narrative developments or the acquiring of temporary abilities, such as gaining a particular contact or establishing important backstory elements in the middle of a game. It would seem that one of the goals of revising the rules in Numenera, Discovery, and Destiny was to make the cipher system more consistent with itself. The cipher system doesn't rely on adding stacks of modifiers and bonuses to die rolls. Instead, it applies character strengths directly to the task difficulty and thus simplifies the rolling of dice by using the result as it appears on the die while also giving players the sense that their character's strengths and weaknesses actively made things easier or harder. This choice goes in the opposite direction of adding numbers to a die roll, and by eliminating familiarity as it existed in the legacy material, the system becomes more consistent in this way. That said, Numenera Discovery does mention that there may be certain circumstances where a plus one or a plus two on a die roll could be possible. This is mostly left up to GM ruling based on certain conditions at certain times, but it's no longer something the player can actively decide to incorporate into the function of their their character, as there are not only more effective options available, but keeping the cipher system consistent with how it treats difficulty in die rolls makes for a more consistent experience. In 2013, only GMs could activate intrusions. Numenera Discovery and Destiny brought player intrusions into existence, though in some ways this was something many groups were kind of doing already. While I was running games out of the Legacy book, I would often ask players who wanted to refuse GM intrusions to do so by also offering narrative explanation along with their spending of XP. My perspective was that the events of the GM intrusion will likely still happen, but the influence on the player will be mitigated or cancelled out by the spending of XP 
and a bit of narrative creation. In some ways, player intrusions sort of existed from the beginning, as spending a single XP, the cost of player intrusions in Numenera, Discovery, and Destiny, and the cost of refusing a GM intrusion in the Legacy book, ultimately would change the narrative by mitigating or canceling out a GM intrusion. The introduction of player intrusions substantially improves the game by allowing players to take control of the narrative or easily accomplish complex tasks by spending XP instead of debating how something could be done via the rules. It keeps the story moving. The nature of an intrusion is still up to a GM to accept or deny, but it can lead to wild and unexpected developments in an adventure. The spirit of the Legacy book in 2013 contained enough material to last a group for years, and the way in which Numenera and most Cypher system books communicate their settings and rules allows for players and GMs to endlessly create in these imaginative sandboxes, bringing their own interpretations, influences, and creative energies to the table. For those who felt that the Legacy book gave them all they needed to explore a far-flung future of the weird and the exotic, Discovery offers a streamlined and updated set of rules to make such experiences experiences even more possible. It is also fully compatible with the variety of supplements MCG published between the 2013 release and Discovery and Destiny, with only the few rules changes I mentioned in this video. But it's in Numenera's second volume, Destiny, that things get very interesting. While a full and comprehensive review of Destiny is outside the scope of this video, I will say that this volume not only greatly expands on what a game of Numenera can be, but it also provides more resources to go even further with the spirit of discovery and exotic storytelling. The three new types, for example, the Archai, Rites, and Delves, augment social interaction, resource management and creation, and deep exploration in exponential ways, boosted by an in-depth crafting system and sets of settlement and community rules that allow for structure and advancement to support engaging roleplay and storytelling. These new rules not only provide more interesting game design opportunities, but they also encourage a kind of vocabulary where it concerns discussion of the game and in-character roleplay. Beyond that, the emphasis on community and creation mean that a game of new era can chart itself out in ways that defy the expectations of what a tabletop RPG can be. Players can invest themselves in supporting or establishing communities, or can roll up their sleeves and get into the thoroughly detailed crafting system to come up with solutions to problems on the path, or provide infrastructural support to communities braving the challenges of living in the ninth world. These rules give players more to work toward than straightforward character advancement. Instead of allowing them to focus on interacting with the social and material aspects of the Ninth World in new ways, these rules can easily be drip-fed into a game that hasn't made much use of them in the past. Injecting only Iotum, for example, into an existing Numenera game based on either the legacy rules or discovery on its own already makes the game so much more flavorful and opens up all kinds of new abilities. Numenera in many ways has been made complete by the publication of Discovery and Destiny, both in terms of the function of the previous cipher system rules and where it concerns the spirit and potential of exploring a mysterious and remarkable world filled with incredible technological remnants of unknown civilizations. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I hope it sheds some light on the differences between Numenera's original publication and where the game exists now in the 2020s. If you enjoyed the content in this video, please consider subscribing to The Infinite Construct here on YouTube and following the channel on Twitter and Twitch for more Numenera and Cypher system content.